This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University. And today I want to answer the question, did Michael Saylor just abandon Bitcoin? I've been getting this question a lot of my videos the last two days. Question here, uh, Saylor abandoned ship, steps down from CEO of MicroStrategy. Will you be doing a video about this in the near future? And someone else saying, what are your thoughts on Michael Saylor stepping down as CEO? I guess the company won't be buying any more Bitcoin. So I want to correct some of the assumptions that people are making. The mainstream media and other media outlets, especially crypto outlets, are not helping the situation. We have uh, the website Decrypt talking about how Michael Saylor is a Bitcoin fanatic. Probably they don't like him just because the way he talks about altcoins. We have the Wall Street Journal of all places, and this used to be a reputable Journal has become completely irresponsible running a, a, a headline like this, Michael Saylor bet billions on Bitcoin and lost. Very, very misleading. Then, of course, some good humor on Twitter. Uh, I'm leaving to spend more time with my Bitcoin. I thought this was a pretty funny joke, though it could be also construed as being misleading. Bloomberg saying that Bitcoin's laser-eyed king is blind to $1 billion loss. And this subhead title here was MicroStrategy is delaying the inevitable on its cryptocurrency bet, not even saying that this is just a pure Bitcoin bet. So there's a lot of misleading misleading headlines out there. I want to talk a little bit about what's really going on. I think this is an unfair headline, especially this one especially bothered me simply because what's happened here is Bitcoin has fallen below the average price at which Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy bought it. And this leads to some accounting effects, which we're going to talk about. But to say that this is a billion dollar loss is a ridiculous thing. And it also is, I would say, economically illiterate. And I thought I would make this point by taking a look at IBM, International Business Machines, take a look at their balance sheet and what has happened to it. They're in a somewhat similar uh, uh, software, software business, at least most of their revenues come from this. If we take a look at their balance sheet over the past year, we can see cash and equivalents currently sitting on about seven billion dollars. These are, All these numbers are in thousands. You have to add three zeros. But cash and equivalents on IBM's balance sheet, about $7 billion. It was approximately $7 billion a year ago. So if I were working for the Wall Street Journal and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to write a, a headline like this, what I could do is I could take year over year CPI inflation, which has been about 9.1%. This probably understates the true inflation rate in the U.S., and what I would do is I would apply that inflation rate to the cash on IBM's balance sheet. So I would say that basically they've been sitting on about $7 billion worth of cash over the past 12 months. We've had CPI inflation of a little bit over 9%. And so basically they have a loss because they were storing this in US dollars. They have a loss of $668 million in terms of their purchasing power. This cash is simply not as powerful on IBM's balance sheet as it was a year ago. I'm not sure why they're holding this much cash. I haven't really looked into the company that closely, but this is how misleading it is to say that uh, a company has lost by putting on a long-term inflation hedge and then taking a very short time period and saying that they've they've lost money. No one is criticizing IBM for keeping their, their money, their US dollars, their cash in US dollars and losing purchasing power in the process. So if I were working for the Wall Street Journal today, I could write a sensationalist headline very similar to what they've done with MicroStrategy. I could write it about IBM and basically with reference to their loss of purchasing power of their cash, I could write a headline like this, zombie tech company loses over half a billion dollars of cash war chest. And this would actually be a much better and more accurate headline than what the Wall Street Journal has done. So what's really happened with Michael Saylor? What is the true story? And what is MicroStrategy going to be doing going forward? That's what I want to cover in this video. Before I cover that, though, I'd just ask you to please like and subscribe this video if you're, you've are you been enjoying it so far. So as of last year, Michael Saylor was chairman and CEO, chief executive officer. And what has happened effective in a, this will take effect in a couple of days from now, but there's been a change where he is now just executive chairman and Fong Li is going to take over as president and CEO. And Fong Li has been at the company for a while. 
This was the statement that uh, Michael Saylor made as part of their filings. I will remain an executive officer of the company and chairman of the board of directors, as well as assuming the chair of investments committee and leading our Bitcoin acquisition strategy. It's completely inaccurate to say that MicroStrategy will not be buying any Bitcoin going forward. They've said that they're going to be doing it. And there's no reason to say this as a publicly traded company, unless that's what you believe. So we can continue to expect Michael Saylor to dollar cost average using the company's earnings to dollar cost average and move their corporate treasury, their cash uh, from fiat into Bitcoin. Michael Saylor went on to say, my focus is Bitcoin advocacy and education, like with the Bitcoin Mining Council and being spokesperson and envoy to the global Bitcoin community. So this is what the official statement is as far as we can tell and if if michael saylor had sold some microstrategy uh shares of stock we would we would get a filing the most recent filing that i could find is from february february of 2021 this is the most recent uh this was back when he sold a little bit of uh a few of his shares not a huge not a huge amount but so his current ownership of microstrategy and again if he had been selling any shares he has to file this and disclose it um, so he still owns over 2.3 million shares of stock. This represents obviously billions of dollars worth of wealth. And, and he owns 23.7% of the company. So he's still a major force at the company, not just by force of personality and will, but as a major, uh, a major equity holder. And the company also confirmed, and the new CEO, uh, Mr. Lee, confirmed that they're not going to be selling any Bitcoin. So basically, we have Michael Saylor going all in on Bitcoin and focusing on how he can help the Bitcoin ecosystem and help MicroStrategy accumulate more Bitcoin while the new CEO can focus on the software operations piece of the business. If we take a look at their most recent filing, their 10Q, we can see that as of the end of the quarter, June 30th, 2022, they still held approximately 129 129,699 Bitcoin. That's up from 120, uh, approximately 124,000 as of uh, six months ago. So they haven't sold any Bitcoin. In fact, they've been accumulating it. Now you may be seeing these, these headlines, which are, are very, while being accurate from an accounting perspective, they're very, very silly. And to someone who's not familiar with the way the accounting of financial states statements work, might think that this is a company that's bleeding money, that there's been some uh, permanent problem that happens here when you talk about almost a billion dollar impairment charge. What this is, is it's a stupid accounting rule. It's probably there for some reason for some businesses. It's never made any sense to me. And you have to distinguish it from the operating results of a company. What this is, is, is just, this is just a marking to market of assets that are held on the balance sheet. And then if that is a negative mark to market, in other words, if the price of the assets and the price, in this case, the price of Bitcoin is below the average price where MicroStrategy uh, bought it, you have to apply an impairment charge to earnings. This is a paper charge. Uh, this is just a paper loss. They haven't sold any Bitcoin. They haven't locked in this loss. If you're bearish on Bitcoin, as most of the mainstream financial media is, you view this as a permanent loss. But for those who understand Bitcoin, they realize Bitcoin is very volatile. This could really, I think their average average cost is something like 30000 This position could easily swing to a massive gain in just a matter of hours or days. So these sort of headlines are nothing to worry about. They do cause uh, stress for shareholders who don't who don't understand them. But it's a very unfair way of doing things because basically you have to apply this impairment charge to earnings if the price of Bitcoin falls or the price of any asset that is subject to these accounting rules if it falls below your average purchase price. But then what happens is if the price of Bitcoin goes back above the price paid, you don't get to add that profit back to earnings. And this is the really silly thing about it. And in order to add that back to earnings, so this looks like a permanent earnings loss, not on the operations side, but on sort of the accounting side. But if the price of Bitcoin were going to go were to go back above 30,000, approximately where their average cost is, MicroStrategy as a publicly traded company subject to gap accounting rules would not get to add, would not get to add that profit to earnings. The only way they'd be able to do that is if they converted the Bitcoin, if they sold it for dollars or other fiat. So these impairment charges, 
they are temporary. They can reverse themselves uh, eventually if uh, MicroStrategy were to sell the Bitcoin. But again, what matters, this is a basically uh, become almost like a Bitcoin ETF. What matters are the assets on the balance sheet? Are they going to stay there? What future earnings will be in the sense that this will be the cash, the future cash flows that Sailor will use to buy more Bitcoin? But this is a ridiculous accounting rule. And this is one problem. This is an accounting rule that needs to be changed by FASB and by uh, the general uh, the way gap accounting is done simply because it doesn't um, it it adds a lot of headline risk and I would suggest and I've suggested in a previous video that this is one reason that Musk sold 75 percent of Tesla's Bitcoin they couldn't handle the volatility to earnings caused by these impairment charges he could not handle the impairment charge accounting heat whereas Michael Saylor. Uh, Michael Saylor could. And again, Saylor understands Bitcoin much, much better than someone uh, like Musk does. I thought this was a great tweet from Michael Saylor, basically saying that since MicroStrategy adopted a, uh, since MicroStrategy adopted a Bitcoin strategy back in August of 2020, its enterprise value has gone up 5 billion. It's up 730%. The stock itself is up 123%. And we have to take this in the context of what Bitcoin has done. Now, again, they didn't buy all their Bitcoin. MicroStrategy did not buy all their Bitcoin on August 10th, 2020. And so it's this is a little bit misleading. And if you're dollar cost averaging in every day, your results might be different. But MicroStrategy stock over this period, over this two-year period, approximately up 123%, Bitcoin up 94%, the S&P up 23%, and then individual tech stocks, you can see how MicroStrategy has outperformed Amazon, which is down 14%, down uh, Meta, Meta or Facebook, down almost 40%, and Netflix down 53%. So this is the context for how MicroStrategy has performed. It's outperformed all these indices, all these key benchmarks, as well as other big tech stocks. So this is what's not covered. Over that same period too, two very quote unquote safe investments, bonds down 14% and gold down 13%, silver down 29%. So this is the context for MicroStrategy's losses. And again, these are paper losses. You'll think they're permanent losses if you're bearish on Bitcoin. And if you're not, you understand that these losses will rever reverse themselves. So just to put their finances in perspective, they currently own approximately 129,699 Bitcoin. At current prices, we're roughly at $23,000 per Bitcoin. As I'm recording this, that's about $2.98 billion value for that 129,000 Bitcoin. If we were to 10X from here, as I think we will in the coming years, we're actually gonna go much higher than this, I think. But if we just only 10X from here to $230,000 per Bitcoin, and again, that might seem like a crazy, absurd statement. If you watch all my videos, you'll understand my fundamental reason, reasoning behind this, but that would bring the value of the Bitcoin on their balance sheet to 29, almost $30 billion. And to put that in perspective, MicroStrategy is currently being valued. The market cap, in other words, the number, total number of shares times the price per share, in other words, the equity value of the entire company, $3.5 billion. Their current enterprise value, which adjusts for their debt holdings and their cash holdings, this is basically the amount of money you need to pony up in order to take over the entire company and take over their debt as well. This would be $5.46 billion, and their long-term debt is a measly 2.37 billion. So in the context of this, if you think Bitcoin is going down and gonna stay down, then MicroStrategy uh, could be in serious trouble. But if we take a look at their current long-term debt, it's less than the value of their Bitcoin even right here. So they could liquidate their Bitcoin. It's a little unclear what the taxes would be on that. Uh, I guess there wouldn't be any taxes since it'd be sold at a loss. They could liquidate their Bitcoin right now, pay off all their long-term debt, and the company would be fine. Now, this is obviously not what they want to do or what they're going to do, but this puts their debt load into perspective. I personally think that Michael Saylor is a wonderful uh, speaker, a wonderful uh, interviewee, and a wonderful educator. I've learned a lot from him listening to various interviews and podcasts that he has done. I do think that he's one of the good guys, that he's a true Bitcoiner, and that his interest in Bitcoin is genuine. 
when you reach this this level of wealth, it really allows you to focus on the things you care the most about, and for him to just be pretending that um, pretending that he likes Bitcoin when he doesn't, and suffering all this headline risk, all these impairment charges, uh, headline risk from financial publications, you wouldn't go through something like this unless you were a true believer. If he's cynical about Bitcoin, if he's going to dump it, he's not going to be saying that their holding period is at least four years. This is not something you say uh, you say publicly. It gets you into a lot of trouble. I would say, though, I continue to prefer holding Bitcoin over MicroStrategy. As I've always said in my videos since I first covered MicroStrategy, Bitcoin is a digital asset. MicroStrategy, even if it's a good company and holds a lot of Bitcoin, it is still an equity. It's still a piece of paper in, in many ways. And the nice thing about Bitcoin, it cannot be confiscated if you hold your own private keys. And this contrasts with MicroStrategy. If I buy the stock, I have to hold it in a brokerage account in the street's name. There are many layers uh, separate, separating me from MicroStrategy's Bitcoin if I pursue a strategy like that. Now, I'm not that worry, worried about America today that somehow my stock certificate is going to be uh, taken away, uh, my digital stock certificate, and my I won't have access. But these things can happen. It, they can also happen to completely innocent people who haven't done anything wrong and they get their bank accounts and brokerage accounts frozen. So Bitcoin does have this uh, this property. And I do think we're entering a period, even in the US, where re really bad things could happen to your assets just based on political views. Maybe you, you still support the First Amendment or Second Amendment, very terrible things like this. And as a result, you get your assets frozen. So that's a nice thing about Bitcoin. It has very clear upside as well. Unlike an operating company like MicroStrategy, which is made up of fallible human beings, just like you and me, Bitcoin does not have any operational risk. There is protocol risk. I would say that it's been mitigated, that it's not a real risk. If someone were to hack Bitcoin, they would have done it already. But MicroStrategy has operations risk, operational risk. Various things could happen to their headquarters, could happen to their, their core business, which is at this point relatively small relative to their Bitcoin holdings. The thing I like about just holding Bitcoin itself there's no embedded leverage here. MicroStrategy does have this debt and it could cause problems if Bitcoin uh, stays low or goes uh, goes lower. I think their, their liquidation price though on, on their margin loans uh, basically is around $3,000 per Bitcoin. So I don't think there's a real risk that we go that low, but you, you never know. And Bitcoin is a really strange beast. But if you hold Bitcoin instead of holding MicroStrategy shares, you get to hold it in your own name. You get to hold your own private keys. You don't have this kind of corporate risk. You don't have leverage risk. I'm assuming you're not going to leverage your Bitcoin, which is an insane thing, insane thing to do, especially given its volatility. If MicroStrategy's Bitcoin gets stolen, and they have said, uh, I believe they are holding it in a micro, in a uh, a multi-sig, some sort of multi-sig solution. They're not relying on a custodian for it which is great, and I'm sure they're doing a good job of it, but I personally rather hold my own private keys and not trust someone at MicroStrategy to hold my Bitcoin for me or to, to give me my exposure to Bitcoin. So if my own Bitcoin gets stolen or lost, it's my own fault, but at least I have myself to blame and I wouldn't want uh, something to happen to MicroStrategy's Bitcoin and then I would lose my exposure to Bitcoin. So these are, to summarize, these are all the reasons why I continue to hold Bitcoin and I don't hold any MicroStrategy stock. But I think one of the takeaways here, besides the fact that we have such terrible journalists, especially in the financial realm, especially in the coverage when it comes to covering Bitcoin, we really, really deserve better journalists. Um, but I think the other really the, the other takeaway is a really sad thing, which is that the SEC, Gary Gensler, a very evil organization, actually. And we now know how much Gary Gensler understands Bitcoin and he is not uh, proving himself really to be a friend to Bitcoin. We still don't have a spot ETF. In other words, a way for people to hold in the form of an equity to hold Bitcoin. Uh, so in, in other words, an ETF that's backed by, not backed by Bitcoin futures, but backed by Bitcoin, the physical Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself. And this is a ridiculous thing. People have said that it's too volatile or it's not liquid enough and that this is why the SEC is not yet approved it, but the SEC has approved many very terrible ETFs. I'm going to show you one right now. The problem with not having a Bitcoin spot ETF is you're going to end up with people and institutions who, for whatever 
reasons, uh, maybe for their charter reasons or for personal reasons. They cannot hold Bitcoin. They want to hold it in the form of, of an ETF. Maybe it's in a retirement account and they want to make it easier to hold it there. The problem is these people will then they'll go into MicroStrategy, which as we talked about is not a pure play on Bitcoin. It's a pretty pure play, but not a completely pure play. And again, it's not your keys, not your coins or people who cannot hold Bitcoin. And because there's no Bitcoin spot ETF, they can't own that. They'll go into GBTC and they'll have to pay this 2% annual management fee. So it's ridiculous to say that uh, a spot, a Bitcoin spot ETF is too risky in the context I'm about to show you. And this is one reason they said they haven't approved it, but the SEC and Bloomberg itself, Bloomberg put their name on this, they approve of UCO, which is the ProShares Ultra Bloomberg Crude Oil. Uh, it's an ETN or an, uh, actually it's an ETF. This gives you 2X daily leverage to the price of crude oil. Outrageous expense ratio of 0.95%. This is extremely volatile and it has a huge amount of tracking error as these leveraged ETFs do. So here's the price of crude oil, the front contract, in other words, basically the cash price of crude oil or the most, the most uh, close contract for delivery. And we can see oil going negative here. We can see roughly what the chart of oil looks like. If we look at the chart of UCO, because of these daily compounding effects, we can see that UCO has gone off a cliff. It's gone from 240, uh, almost went to zero, and is now at 35. It looks nothing like the chart of crude oil. And yet the SEC thinks that this is a perfectly legitimate ETF to offer to the American public and to offer to public investors, and they won't approve a Bitcoin spot ETF. Now, obviously, a spot ETF becomes much more difficult to control. It's going to eat up a lot of Bitcoin and, and hold it. And it's a little bit different. There's a talk that you can, you can manipulate Bitcoin with, uh, or try to manipulate, I should say, with futures contracts, with paper Bitcoin. And of course, all of this is true. It's uh, a little more dangerous to try to do this with Bitcoin than to try to do it with gold. And I have talked about that in other videos. Uh, but this is the America that we live in, where Gary Gensler pretends to be protecting us from one financial product like a Bitcoin spot ETF, but he allows something like UCO to trade on the markets. And this is one of the things I hope Bitcoin is going to clean up. I hope it's going to clean up and continue to make these financial journalists look like fools, continue to make people who criticize a very reasonable investment perspective, which is investing your excess cash into Bitcoin and as well as the, the regulators. I hope Bitcoin continues to shine the light on these people and to show what shameful people they are. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.